Good evening. Thank you very much for coming to the mayoral debate. I know there's been quite a few uh, throughout Pasadena, but this is for our two neighborhood associations. I'm Chuck Livingstone, president of Madison Heights Neighborhood Association, in conjunction with Carol Chua, who is president of Oak Knoll Neighborhood Ch Association. Where's Carol? Carol's over there. This is a joint effort on the two associations to put together for our two neighborhoods, along with some residents from Lombardy and from the Caltech area to have their chance to address the issues that pertain to uh, you guys and your neighborhood. Um, I also had mentioned uh, a little bit earlier that uh, we had culinary school from Blair High that, that provided all of the uh, food that's out in the patio. So they do a terrific job of, uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> One other house rule, house, uh, rule is that men's room is out this door, right behind this wall, and the ladies' lounge is down the hallway by the uh, red bench. If you, ever, if you have a need to ask a question, there'll be monitors around here with cards, three by five cards, to um, your chance to write down a few questions at the end. Uh, we'll take an opportunity to address some of your concerns or issues, if not already uh, talked about uh, by the six candidates. I have to inform you as a disclosure that this is being recorded and videoed on behalf of uh, Pasadena Media on chapter on channel 32 uh, and if you have any questions you might be in the video just to let you know um, okay um, I'd like to introduce the uh, the uh, headmaster of Polly and that's John Brocker I won't speak very long, and um, I'm not announcing my candidacy for mayor, so just let's play. Anyway, my name is John Brocker, and I am the uh, head of the Polytechnic School, and I'm just um, here to welcome you. I'm thrilled you're all here um, and get a chance to hear uh, these great candidates and what's going on. We're happy you're able to come on our campus and see a little bit about what we are. So anyway, welcome. Have a great evening. I'm looking forward to it, too. Thank you. Thank you, John. And my next, uh, our moderator is Larry Wilson, editor of the Pasadena Star News, and he will uh, go through the procedures and how we're going to address the questions and answers. Um, every candidate will be given two minutes for um, their opening, and they uh, will be reminded when uh, time is coming near. That's the bell. And uh, I'm the bell keeper. So we'll go from there. Larry? Thank you so much for my good friend Chuck, um, who I will remind um, I am. There was a period of a dozen years when I was the editor of this Pasadena Star News. Um, you could blame the news then on me, but now I'm called the public editor and I, you can blame the opinions on me. Um, thank you so much to John and Polly for having us into um, their fantastic campus. It's, uh, it's lovely to be here, and to both of the neighborhood associations for putting this together. Next Wednesday night, um, the Star News is having a forum, if you just can't get enough of this stuff, uh, at McKinley School um, at 6 o'clock on Wednesday. So come on back if you haven't had enough of these six formidable candidates um, for mayor of Pasadena. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was introducing... Um, the current mayor of Pasadena at a, an event for the Pasadena Museum of History, I, something came over me and I introduced him as a historical figure. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and soon he will be that. And uh, it, 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 after 16 years of uh, his uh, estimable uh, mayorhood, mayorship, um, it's, it's a tough act to follow. I think all the candidates would agree. And, and I'm so pleased that so many, um, six great Pasadenans have um, stepped up uh, to this um, 
to, to seek the privilege of, uh, of being the mayor of our city. And it's going to, I think, I, I feel a focus coming now, I, you know, uh, as the election approaches um, that maybe hadn't been before, but now these forums are being incredibly well attended and people are really, you know, trying to get to know these candidates. And so we hope we'll all get to know them better and, and, and have, it, uh, have this evening help make up our own minds. The format is going to be a, a, a minute, um, I mean two minutes, sorry, a minute at the end, two minutes of introduction from each candidate. Um, and, um, and then we'll go to questions, uh, both some questions that we've put together uh, from the associations and a lot of your questions have already come in and questions from, um, uh, that, 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 that come in as well that we haven't touched on. Um, we will be holding people to those one minute limits. Uh, Chuck will be ringing that bell, so candidates please think of that and please stop when the bell dings at 10 seconds of. Um, so for the introductions, I'm going to have to mix it up, obviously, when we ask some of the questions. Uh, but for the introductions, I think we can go right from Alan to Don to Terry to Bill to Jackie to Jason, and that's what we're going to do. Alan, tell us uh, why you want to be mayor of Pasadena and who you are. Well, my name is Alan Shea. First of all, I'd like to thank Polly, uh, John, Star News for accommodating us tonight so we can get to know each other as a community. Um, my name again is Alan Shea. I'm a product of Pasadena, graduated from John Muir High School, went to Elliott, uh, also went to uh, Madison Elementary School, uh, PCC, graduated from USC, started a consulting firm on Lake and Cordova, been there for 35 years, uh, then went to law school, uh, got my broker's license, uh, been involved with the community all my life, uh, as I should say, since I've been here in Pasadena. And I love this, this community. The reason why I'm running for mayor is because as I look around Pasadena, it is such a great community that we need to keep it great. I believe from the bottom of my heart that this, there's an opportunity for us to bring a new chapter for society right here in Pasadena. We started it 126 years ago with the tournament. We could start it anew with a new mayor uh, trying to reach the level of Bill Bogart and keep our community safe, healthy, and prosperous as we take on a new uh, chapter in Pasadena. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. Don Morgan. Thank you, Larry. Uh, thank you to the Madison Heights Community or, uh, Neighborhood Association and Oak Knoll and Polly. It's great to be here with neighbors. We live on uh, South Madison, so um, it's nice to see a lot of you. Usually I see you walking your dogs by our house. Um, I, I'm, uh, my name's Don Morgan, I'm, as the name tag would imply. Uh, I am thrilled to be here with you tonight. I think what's so neat about these forums is uh, it's an opportunity for all of you to see just how different the six of us are uh, in every way, shape, and form. And, and, and I think that'll allow folks to have a clear sense of you know, very distinct choices in this race. You know, we differ dramatically in terms of our personalities, in terms of our experiences, and even in terms of our view of what the mayor does in this town. I, I joked the other night that, you know, I'm not totally convinced we're actually running for the same job. Uh, but, um, but nonetheless, you know, I think um, we have people who are very excited about trying to find ways to improve Pasadena. You know, our charter has set up our mayor's position to promote the best of what we do as a community and bring additional resources to our greatest opportunities uh, to improve areas where we know we can get stronger as a community. Um, and, and so the, the mayor is designed to set the priorities for the city in partnership with the community uh, in order to create an ambitious vision for us continuing to strengthen our community every day. That looks different than, uh, than um, being one vote amongst eight on the city council. It's a distinctly different set of experiences that are necessary for the mayor to succeed in creating that type of vision. And my experience is dramatically different than anyone else uh, in, in the race. I've been working for the last 20 years with nonprofit organizations, communities, and governments to solve our toughest problems. And in particular, what I've been looking at is finding private sector solutions to public sector problems. So how do we align our work in such a way that we can address some of our toughest challenges? Um, that's two minutes? Wow. I guess I'll answer the rest. Ten more seconds? Oh, thank you. Well, I hope to be able to answer the rest of this as I answer questions tonight, so thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.
Thank you, Don. Terry Tornick. Thank you. Um, in addition to the requisite thank yous to the neighborhood associations and to Polly, I'd, I'd like to thank all of you for showing up uh, tonight. Um, I, I think it takes a lot uh, for people to come out and, and listen to us uh, talk to you, but I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. Um, I was not born in Pasadena. I was born in Brooklyn. And uh, my family, I was educated at Princeton and Columbia, and my family moved out here in 1982. Uh, when I took the job as planning director for the city, and my primary task during that period was the revitalization of old Pasadena. Uh, and I'm very proud of my association with that. I then made a career in, in, private, in the private sector in real estate um, and formed my own company in 1999, which has given me the ability to run for this office. Um, I served on the planning commission, on the design commission, um, and I've been on the city council for the past six years representing this district, for, for those of you that, that are not uh, from here. Um, I've been walking the city for the past 16 months, talking to voters, and what I've discovered is that, uh, because I wanted to find out what, what they were thinking about, what their priorities are, and I've discovered that people uh, are very proud to be Pasadenans, uh, but they know that we can do better. And I think all of us have ideas about how we can do better. Um, I think that uh, our objectives tonight are to answer your questions and demonstrate uh, which among us is best suited to do this job. I hope by the end of the evening that you'll have a sense that at least in my case that I have the combination of education and technical skills uh, and service, community service and public service within the city uh, to qualify me to, uh, to succeed Bill Bogard. But I appreciate your patience and again, thank you for coming out. Thank you, Terry. Bill Thompson. Thank you very much, Larry. Um, unlike the others up here, I'm the only candidate who has previously served as the mayor of Pasadena. Um, I spent 16 years on the Pasadena City Council representing District 7, which is Poly School, and this area right here exactly. And two of those years were as the mayor of the city. So I know what the job is. I've done it. I think my record is I've done it uh, very well. So I, I would. Uh, uh, put that forward as a, a large uh, piece of my experience and the record demonstrating that I have not only the experience but also the community trust uh, and um, uh, support for uh, doing this job. The position of mayor is not like anything else. It's not a figurehead. It's actually the leader of the community. Uh, you have to lead the city council. You have to lead the entire community. You have to be able to work with people, reach agreement on what is to be done how to do it, and then be able to go and achieve results. And uh, so I've served in that role. I also currently serve as an elected trustee at Pasadena City College and as president of the, of the uh, board of the Pasadena Educational Foundation. So I have a broad uh, spectrum of background in this community. In fact, if you look at the um, uh, piece of information that uh, my wife Carol was handing out to you, uh, you'll see a, a number of things that the two of us have done myself particularly, and we're very, very grateful for that opportunity. So I put that forth as reasons for trusting me to go back and do the job again. I would not just be talking about what is involved. I know what's involved. I've done it before. I know how to do it, and I will lead again. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Bill. Jackie Robinson. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jackie Robinson. I am your current Vice Mayor of the Pasadena City Council, and I've been a member of the City Council for the last eight years. I'm running for mayor because I want Pasadena to be the most progressive city, the most innovative, and the most creative city of the 21st century. And unlike Mr. Tornick, I had to give up my council seat to run for mayor. And I was okay with that because I'm proud of the record that I built as council member for District 1 over the last eight years. I sit before you tonight because I've been touched in many different ways by Pasadena. I was born and raised here. I'm a product of our public school system, John Muir High School. After that, I went to Berkeley and attended um, law school, and I have an MPA from CSU Northridge. Every aspect of what's best about Pasadena has touched my life, from the Gamble House, from uh, the Pasadena Youth Symphony Orchestra, to the Conservatory of Music, and it's time that everyone in Pasadena can see themselves and their values reflected in the policies that are coming out of City Hall. As mayor, one of the aspects that I want to bring to the seat 
is to make sure that all of Pasadena is represented and we not just talk about Pasadena south of the freeway, but make an active effort to concentrate on services and programming north of the freeway as well. I'm proud to be supported by a diverse coalition of individuals and organizations, including the Los Angeles County Democratic Party, the Los Angeles County <coughs> Federation of Labor, and the Women's Political Caucus of Greater Pasadena. And I so hope that you have very interesting questions for us tonight. This is our fifth of almost 10 candidate forums that we've been in. And uh, I hope to earn your vote, and I'm asking for your vote for mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Jason Harden. Uh, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be here. It's, al it's also an honor to be mayor, uh, running for mayor of Pasadena. Um, I moved to Pasadena freshman year of high school, and I graduated from Pasadena High School. Um, I want to be mayor because I want to bring hope to my community and to the city. I've overcome cancer. I've overcome homelessness. I've overcome poverty. And I believe I've overcome those things so successfully because of this city. It has made me who I am. I think I've accomplished anything I've ever wanted to accomplish in life because of being in Pasadena. I've never loved the city or place so much. And um, I wanted to kind of bring those opportunities and share that experience with the folks in my neighborhood, immediate neighborhood, and with everyone else in the city. I do believe everybody has to feel they matter. I wanted to be an example of proactiveness. I wanted to show what could happen and what you can accomplish if you just pursue your dreams and just do what you really wanted to do in life and become what you wanted to become in life. I'm a publisher of the Dina Magazine. I created my magazine just to, cre just to create a way and an outlet for, for a voice in Pasadena and for my neighborhood. I also wanted to cre create a, a way for us to promote our local talents, our local businesses, and a lot of the programs that we have going on in Pasadena. I do, pa I do believe Pasadena is more than just Rose Parades and Rose Bowl games, and I want to show the world that. Um, we have a lot of wonderful things in our city, and we have a lot of challenges. And I believe since I've overcome so many challenges to be where I'm at today, that I can help the city do the same thing. Thank you. Well, Bulldogs notwithstanding, I have to say with uh, Jackie and Alan, go you mighty Mustangs and go Bears. Go so there are two big things in their favor right here. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, the first question we're going to go to uh, is, is something we've heard a lot from um, people in this neighborhood, and it's about traffic. Uh, and by the way, I've, I'm going to mix up the, 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 the way that you guys answer. I've got some random ways going, but everybody will be able to go first at least once through these questions. And, uh, so, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll mix it up th after that. But this, th by the way, this, this traffic question is going to go uh, Bill, Jackie, Jason, Terry, Don, and Alan. Uh, you'll get your chances uh, otherwise. So, Bill Thompson, that's a heads up to you about traffic. Um, uh, some of the folks in, in, in this bright neighborhood have done some of the numbers, about 15,000 cars uh, transiting South Oak Knoll every day, comparable on Marengo and Los Robles. These are residential neighborhoods. We know all of you have come out uh, against the 710 tunnel which we're going to see the EIR on that pretty soon. But we, uh, lots of people in the audience and, and those of us formulating questions wanted to know about the plans that you have that, that don't have to do with chicanes and, uh, and that might answer some of the questions about our version of traffic circles in Europe. You get to go through that circle. Here we have the belt and suspenders approach where you stop and then you go around the circle. So, uh, <laughs> so first to Bill. Um, uh, how are you going to get more creative than that in dealing with the traffic impact, which we can all um, uh, guess is only going to be getting worse? Well, if you've ever driven around those roundabouts in London, I think you'll know you're better off stopping than just going. <laughs> um, I've done that. I don't want to do that again, that's for sure. But uh, uh, traffic is certainly an issue. Uh, I live on Arden Road, and um, uh, that has become kind of the, uh, and has been for a number of years, kind of the excuse or the way for people to get from California Boulevard to the passing of freeway, the 110 freeway. And uh, we've tried um, uh, uh, bumps, we've tried uh, stop signs, et cetera. So lots of things we tried uh, back when I was on the city council. Um, we need to do a better job of this. I mean, what, part of the problem we face is that the 210 freeway is like bumper to bumper. So what's happening is uh, trucks and traffic or cars get off that, 
they use Colorado Boulevard for their freeway access. So we have things we need to do, like uh, making it easier to get to Bob Hope Airport uh, through light rail to uh, LAX, uh, et cetera. So those are some of the things I would focus attention on. And, and thank you very much, Bill, and thank you, Chuck, and that's a reminder. These are complicated questions, and you've got all of them in it. Uh, so <laughs> we're, we're going to, uh, but thank you for solving it there. Uh, we're, we're going to Jackie, and Jason's on deck. So one of the things that I believe we need to do to alleviate traffic in some of our neighborhoods is to look at it as a regional approach. I've always said that Pasadena is the model for at least making our own attempts to alleviate problems of the region, not just traffic, but um, affordable housing and aspects that other cities have a responsibility for as well. But we know that traffic is like water, and I believe that's one of the reasons why the 710 tunnel issue has become such a huge issue, because even if we do nothing, even if Metro does any, anything, there are still going to be people traversing the city from the 710 up through Pasadena to, in order to get to the 210. And so I think we need to do a better job at working with Metro and Caltrans to do things like synchronizing tra traffic signals throughout the city. Um, making our position as a regional transportation option so that there are multiple modes of transportation throughout the city and ensuring that the transportation options are both efficient and on time so that people will want to take it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jason with uh, Terry on deck. Well, I think the solution is simple. To alleviate traffic, we have to get people out of their cars. We have to become more creative in the way we develop our city and the way we kind of place uh, our buildings and the amenities. We have to take advantage of the gold line and all their stops and kind of make Pasadena more of a walkable city for those that live in our uh, downtown area, as well as just a connected city. We have to kind of, ex we have to explore extending our gold lines. We have to explore extending the green line up and, and the gold line all the way across and also uh, improving our means of getting to Bob Hope Airport and, and to the valley and things like that. But it's just getting a matter of getting people out their cars. And I believe that the complete streets and, and initiatives like that help do that because it creates a walkable city. It creates that that aspect that we don't have to be in our cars, that we can kind of walk to get where we go. We can use public transportation. I'm a big fan of public transportation as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Terry with the Don up next. I think the long-term uh, solutions do relate to land use. And the more mixed use and walkable opportunities we have, the less cars we'll be trying to move around. Pasadena is starting to see that in its downtown area where people are not totally dependent on their automobiles. Beyond that, I think we do have to recognize that streets are, are not just for moving cars, but for moving uh, bicycles and pedestrians as well. We do have some improvements that can be made. The, set, the 710 controversy that people are focused on may offer an opportunity for us to get rid of the grade crossings, at least at California and Glen Arm, which is a tremendous impediment and, and is worrisome in terms of having to get to the hospital, frankly, from this district. So I think there are some improvements that need to be made in our street networks, but the long-term solution, I think Jason is right. I think we have to be thinking about how our future land use patterns are going to govern our lives here. Thank you. Don and then Alan. I think there are some great ideas around smoothing traffic. Obviously, we talked about those in downtown quite a bit. On our street, we have human-sized speed bumps, which just seem to challenge drivers to go faster, so clearly I'm not sure they work. Um, you know, I also would agree, I mean, the reason we have so many people driving is because we have so many people commuting into and out of Pasadena to work, and I think that that's a huge issue for us. I'd like to see us have more workforce housing so people who are serving our community, firefighters, police officers, teachers, hosp nurses, can live in our community and not be driving in from outside. Similarly, we need to be easier on businesses so people can start businesses and maintain businesses here so that they can work in the community where they live. And I think that those two things combined will give us the opportunity to create the type of walkable communities where people can, um, can live close to their, um, their, their jobs and, and walk to the restaurants that they attend and things like that. So I mean, I think we do need to look at long-term solutions so that we get people living in the communities where they're also working. Thank you. Now, uh, finishing up on traffic with uh, Alan. Well, thank you. Uh, as a commissioner in uh, Northwest Pasadena, one of the things we've done to mitigate traffic is we've opened up bike lanes. That's helped out a lot to encourage bicycle riding, 
uh, trying to get traffic off uh, of the main street. So we don't have any bike lanes around here, obviously, but I think if we introduce things that will encourage uh, getting bicycles started, that will be one thing. I think more than anything with the traffic, because my business is on Lake and Cordova for 35 years and I've seen the high traffic, I think we're going to have to look at regulations of lights uh, during peak and high time. I think that's going to have an added value. I think we're going to have to look at how we're going to maximize use of encouraging and educating people about best use, best time. I think those are going to be the simplest, easiest approaches to begin to address uh, the traffic because Pasadena is a growing city. We've grown leaps and bounds and if we continue to, to build and add on what we're doing, we're going to be challenged with traffic unless more education is involved. Okay, uh, thanks so much. Um, th this next question is going to go Terry, Don, Alan, Bill, Jackie, Jason. And it's uh, about something that's a, a statewide and a problem in the West, but also a municipal problem that's about water. Uh, we all do as much as we can to save water. It was easy in December, apparently, 23% down, but that uh, maybe it had something to do with the rain. Uh, I see a lot of folks in my neighborhood, Linda Vista, who don't seem to be following that one day a week. Uh, Thursday's my day, but um, uh, maybe in this neighborhood everything's uh, on the up and up. Uh, so we're trying to save water, and uh, the city has stepped up the pressure on us. There are theoretical $500 fines, but uh, somebody in this neighborhood did some research and found out that it's been reported and confirmed by the city manager's office the city wastes 1.5 million gallons of water every day. Uh, and the problem is obviously old and leaking pipes. We replace three miles of leaky pipes per year, but hundreds of miles of pipes in the city are uh, now over 100 years old. At the current pace, uh, the analysis says that the replacement will be, re uh, in, uh, will be done in 150 years. As mayor, which of you would adhere to the guidelines of the master plan written in 2008, calling for the replacement of eight miles of pipe per year, rising to 18 miles by 2020, and how would you pay for it? And uh, that is the tough question that is going first to uh, Councilman Tornick. One minute answer. Yeah. One minute answer. <laughs> Good luck. I, you can, you can I pick think, any, uh, any part of that. I, I think it's important to, um, uh, to do a better job at building more miles than we have, and, and we will be allocating more money to that. But beyond that, the biggest uh, things that we can do is to convince people that their front yards don't need to be like something out of Sussex, and that. Uh, that a water-wise front yard can be uh, a beautiful place. Um, you should come look at mine on Hudson, <laughs> and you'll see that we haven't had grass for a long time. Um, I think we need to capture more of the water that we're wasting now when we do have storms um, and recharge the Raymond Aquifer, which is a, a terrible waste of water in terms of what we're letting flow down the channel now. And I think we need to begin to make use of the uh, Glendale water from the, from the wastewater treatment plant that we're paying for already uh, to irrigate our golf course, which is the biggest user in the city, as well as our other public parks. Sure, we need to get that coming over the hill. Okay, next on water is Don. I mean, I, I, I think obviously our master plan set ambitious goals for us to replace infrastructure, and it's, they are important uh, replacements. Larry, you just laid it out very well for us. The only way we're going to be able to pay for that is for us to be more efficient with every dollar we spend as a city. We need to be better as a government with the way we use our money. Part of that, again, is getting private sector organizations like local nonprofit organizations to provide a lot of the services that the government has historically ser uh, provided so that we can use more dollars on the public side for these types of important infrastructural uh, uh, challenges as a community. I'll also say we happen to have a place right across the street called Caltech doing some amazingly innovative work around water, and I would like to see us better uh, partner with them to create the most ambitious and innovative approaches to water use and water safe, uh, saving water uh, as a community so that we can be a model for, um, for doing a lot more than just converting our yards, but also um, as, a, as a full city using water more effectively and efficiently. Thank you. Uh, on uh, to Alan. Well, I, I think what we're, what we're going to look at in the future is going back to fundamentals, really being conscious-minded of our water shortage. I think a lot of us are still used to letting our sprinklers go off, 
uh, letting uh, things run as they ha run like the past. What I think we need to do is just change our discipline with water uh, and also uh, have a type of lawn that is less uh, in need of water. And I've seen a lot of those walking around the community the last 90 days. So uh, uh, I see that there are alternative models out there for us. We just have to become educated and get ready to make that change. Thank you. Uh, on the bill. Well, I don't think we're going to be successful in uh, giving, uh, um, getting more water to come down. Uh, it's the snowfall in, uh, at Mammoth Lakes and the Sierras this year, I guess, is not all that great anyway. That's the source of a lot of our water down here. Obviously, we have to do things, for example, what the city does right now, the more, more water you use, the more you pay. And so that itself is an incentive, particularly you get to a certain point in time, uh, to use less water. Uh, we can use yards or renovate yards and put them into uh, uh, no grass and, and uh, no plants or whatever else. But I think the way we have to approach this is to work together as a community. I think we have to get people together, discuss the issue of using Caltech and our own water and power department, et cetera, and the community. Get them involved and to figure out what's the best way to approach this, how can we do it, how will we do it, and then proceed to go and do exactly that. Thank you. Uh, Jackie and then Jason. So I believe we have to have a multi-pronged approach to uh, how we're going to look at water over the next few years and the next few decades, in fact. And you mentioned that uh, one of the huge barriers to building the lines, new lines quicker is money. And um, that's an issue not just for water and for you know, making sure the infrastructure of the city is paid for and that we can do the repairs and improvements, but that's an issue for pretty much every subject. And so we know that budgets are a reflection of our priorities, and as a city, we have to decide what are we going to prioritize. And infrastructure is definitely part of that, but there are other priorities in the city as well. And we have to collectively decide that that is something that we're willing to invest in. I would note that at this time, because of the current embezzlement that the city finds itself in, we need to be realistic. We're not going to be able to go out and ask the taxpayers for additional funds, I believe, at this time, because the city has to uh, regroup and come back from the current embezzlement crisis that we're in so that we can demonstrate to the taxpayers that we are responsible yes. and that, <laughs> That's down. Okay, that we thank are you. responsible <laughs> and can spend the money in a responsible way. He rang that bell right out of his hand and uh, uh, on to Jason. Mm, first off, I'd like to say that I think Pasadena does a great job with its efforts in reducing water usage. I believe that uh, the fact that they pulled up 20 acres of lawn from Brookside Park, as well as creating incentives to convert our yards to more California-friendly, uh, California-friendly uh, landscaping, I think that's that's a great start, you know. And I think that we are doing what we can to kind of lead the way for other cities to kind of do what they can. Also, I do believe that I do agree in in replacing some of these pipes and, and, and increasing the number of pipes that we replace per year. And I think the money should come from a service tax for the Rose Bowl. I do believe that we have a nice venue that can kind of create a revenue through our, through, through our most part enjoy, our, our Rose Bowl. I, if we had a service tax of maybe a dollar or two per ticket, per event, that, that would give us a start on some of these repairs. Thank you. Um, I'm really glad that, uh, that Jackie brought up the elephant in the room, the embezzlement scandal, and I think the next question needs to go to that, and it's going to start Jason, Jackie, Bill, Terry, Don, uh, and Alan. And um, everybody knows about the $6 million of our money that's um, gone somewhere else, uh, and um, we'd like to get it back, but I don't know that we will. But um, uh, so to that question, what went wrong? Um, does it go to the mayor's office or the city manager's office? Uh, to have dealt with it, and should the city manager either resign or be fired? And um, so again, what went wrong? Does the mayor, uh, could the mayor, uh, a mayor, have done something about it? And should uh, city manager Beck uh, take his leave? First to Jason. Well, um, I've stated before that I believe the council sets the tone for how the departments work and operate. I do believe there was lack of accountability across the board. 
I think that if council and as well as the mayor become more involved and a little more proactive in engaging some of our departments in regards to just being there, asking the questions, showing up on site, showing up to the de department head offices, and just making your presence felt. I do believe that accountability will kind of be strengthened by that. Um, people don't like people looking over their shoulders while they work, but I understand that when you do a great job, you don't mind an audience. And I do believe that if we do pay more attention as citizens and ask those questions and, and put pressure on our elected officials to pay attention to what's going on and be more proactive and, and be more involved in how the city operates, then we can kind of avoid this from happening again. And, and I'm just going to use executive privilege. Should the city manager should be gone, yes or no? I'll answer it like this. If uh, Eric Walsh can be gone, I don't believe that uh, <laughs> there's anything that should save Michael Beck from his job. Okay. Uh, Jackie. So I will reiterate, as I've said in, in the past when the city council found this out, that all of us in the city family uh, should be held to a certain level, are held and should be accountable for a certain level of responsibility for this happening, even though it has spanned 11 years prior to both the city manager, the existing council, and both of the department hands that just recently got fired and released from city um, employment. Um, I am committed to the um, structure that the mayor has set out in appointing an ad hoc committee of council members to study how this happened and what we can do to pre prevent it from happening in the future, as well as the appointment of community members to help us go through the hundred, more than 130 funds that we have in the finance department. Um, with regard to the question of should the city manager be fired, at this point I will say I don't know. I have said as well that it's not beyond the scope of the council and I believe the city manager on down, everyone is subject, subject to up to and including firing, but we're still in an investigative phase and right now we're trying to find out answers. I agree with his recent decision to release the finance department manager and the public works manager. Thank you. Bill. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, obviously we have to find out what's happened to our taxpayer money. Uh, you have a $6.4 million going on for over 11 years that's completely unacceptable. Obviously, the city council oversight system didn't work very effectively uh, if that happens. So, yeah, I think we need to have a thorough, complete review of um, what happened. We need to know how it happened, what happened, make sure it will never, never happen again. As uh, was said, the city has 131 funds. You can look through them here and online and all that sort of stuff. All those have to be investigated as well, not because we believe anything has happened there, but just to make sure that nothing has happened there. We need, I would ask the state controller come in and do an audit of all this thing so we know that the city is on the right path. And uh, as I said, the public has to know what happened, how it happened, and be very, very confident it's not going to happen again. Yes or no? I would not fire the city manager at this point in time. I don't know that uh, uh, he is uh, responsible. I mean, he's responsible because he's the overall person in charge, but I would need to know more than that before I would want to fire him. Thank you. Terry. Um, one piece of good news is that I think, uh, contrary to what you may have suggested, I think most of that money will be recovered ultimately. Um, beyond that, I think that the single most uh, responsible feature of, of um, the problem relates to complacency within the building. Um, and I think the mayor has a key role in that in terms of setting a tone with regard to real accountability. And we've started to see that with, they've never been two department heads fired before. Um, and as it relates to the city manager, I think it's, uh, it's too soon to be sure what the outcome there will be. I, I think we need to complete the investigations, including the citizen task force, and then we'll be in a better position to make that judgment. Thank you. Uh, so, Dan and Don. Is it on, did you say me? Yes, I'm sorry. sorry. Did you say Dan, did I, I, said, I said Don. <laughs> okay. I just didn't say it very well. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, you know, the mayor must restore faith, uh, you know, I think in the, in the way we are managing every single precious public dollar um, that we receive as a government. And, and by what we need is a mayor to come in and, and bring best practices that are being implemented across the country to ensure that this never happens again. You know, I've said all along that leadership uh, is really how we respond to crisis, often more than how we get into it. And I have not been satisfied with um, the response to this uh, very significant issue at any level. Uh, you know, it's hard to imagine how we wouldn't want to say 
uh, that we need to fire the city manager when we were so quick to fire two department heads, one who had been here less than three years, uh, you know, and who has received rave reviews, I think, for a lot of her work. So, you know, I think it's going to be very important for us to hold people accountable. Um, unfortunately, and I've been a Michael Beck fan in the past, I think it's going to be tough for him to recover from this. And the only way we're going to ensure that this never happens again is to have new people bringing new ideas to our city government to make sure that we are doing it more effectively in the future. Thank you. And uh, Alan, on the same question. Thank you. I think, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the finance staff for discovering the embezzlement. They were the actual ones who actually found the uh, invoices, brought it to the uh, attention of the committee, uh, finance committee, to move forward with what the op options were to prosecute. So I'd like to put that out front. I think, secondly, the mayor, the city council, uh, are ultimately held responsible. They are who we vote in office to be trusted with how our money is going to be spent. I think thirdly, as to Michael Beck's position, Michael Beck came to Pasadena in 2009. This started in 2003, six years prior to his uh, starting his employment here and without a parent giving an instruction to look into the fund until May 13th at the municipal service meeting. Yes or no on, this, on the city manager? I would say no, because he would need to be vetted thoroughly because this started, this started back in 2003, and he came into employment in 2009 without any instructions to make sure that he's aware of who's managing that account. Unless someone from the top gave him instructions, that, that uh, uh, account was assigned to the individual that was responsible for okay. it and who was ultimately arrested. Thank you, Alan. And uh, we're going to st we're going to uh, start with Alan uh, on this one and go. Alan, Jason, Don, Terry, Bill, Jackie, and we're sticking with finances uh, for the time being. Uh, your time will come, Councilman Rob Councilwoman Robinson. You're going to be tops next. Uh, and but on city finances, um, what do you consider the greatest fiscal challenge facing the city, and why? Uh, what's your solution and does it include new revenue? What do you consider the greatest fiscal challenge facing the city? What's your solution and would you consider new revenues? Well, it's a good question, tough question. I think we have a major problem with our pension. I think that's going to be our biggest challenge because we're going to have more um, employees going into their pension plan with a the liability there. We're going to have uh, more people living longer, so we're going to be carrying those liabilities. And without being able to renegotiate that debt, that's going to be a very big challenge for us. As far as uh, possible new revenues, we're looking into that with the Rose Bowl right now as being our best source. Uh, we could probably look into renegotiating some of the contracts that the city has. Uh, that's what I would do as mayor is look at how we can renegotiate or refinance some of our debts, some of our bonds. Uh, those are some of the things that, that I learned as the oversight uh, vice chair over at PCC to make sure we got projects done on time under budget. Thank you. Thank you. Jason. Well, um, I believe one of the challenges we face is losing businesses to surrounding cities. I think we should be more friendly and, and more accommodating when it comes to small businesses in Pasadena. I do think for what we charge in permit fees and, and in rent, we could be a little more helpful in teaching these businesses to succeed. I believe the solution is creating uh, workshops and, and methods in which we can teach these businesses to tap into Pasadena's brand power. We have such a strong brand power and we're known all over the world. There's no reason why a lot of these businesses fail. It's just a matter of teaching them. And I'm also a big fan of entrepreneurship. I believe that we should teach more of our citizens to become entrepreneurs and support them in that same way. We should give breaks for new businesses and things like that just to kind of spark local uh, commerce and just to keep businesses coming back and, and in creating those, more, uh, those new jobs with these uh, new enterprises that we can kind of accommodate. Thank you. Don. Uh, yeah, I, I think clearly pensions and unfunded liabilities are, are two enormous things that we're facing uh, going forward. Capital projects that we've approved but haven't actually figured out how to fund. 
Um, you know, the, the finance department released uh, in December a pretty startling report on what the next decade looks, for, uh, looks like for us. You know, the there are two ways to raise money. The first way is to become a, a, a more, a more pro-business business climate and bring more businesses in um, so that they can thrive in our community and generate revenues. The other way to save money is to not spend it. Right, or to spend it more effectively, I should say. And again, I think there are other cities that have done that very well. I talk frequently about the city of Baltimore, which moved to a performance-based budgeting model, where they've been able to save money, increase their savings, while also investing in programs and infrastructural investments, and still actually lowering property taxes. So there are models out there that we should be implementing here in our community, because we have the capacity to do things more effectively than anyone. Thank you, Don. Terry. I think the uh, immediate significant challenge that we've got is rebuilding our reserves, um, which have been significantly depleted, uh, while at the same time maintaining a high quality workforce. Um, and, and our salaries represent about 70% of our operating budget. So it, that is a real challenge. I think that the way we grow revenue is by encouraging the sectors of the economy uh, where, we're, where we have a real opportunity. And those include uh, hospitality, healthcare and, and uh, high tech, um, as well as uh, educational institutions, which provide a tremendous uh, boost to the local economy. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Terry. Bill? Well, I think <clears throat> we have to get past the um, embezzlement uh, crisis. And uh, even though we have an insurance policy that will bring us uh, $5 million, that's still not quite $6.4 million. And I think the city attorney will tell you the chance of recovering the balance uh, from the defendants is probably nil and none. So I wouldn't place much hope on that. I think the solution is has to be business. We have to become a business-friendly community. We have to be able to go after business effectively. Uh, I would put together a business retention team or whatever you want to call it on the city staff. Uh, Glendale has that. If you want to go do business in Glendale, you go there. They have people that they will assign to you that will take you through the process, explain it to you, walk you through the process. We need to do that here, too. Uh, we don't do that. We've got vacancies galore on South Lake, East Colorado Boulevard, Northwest Pasadena. We have to put together plans to address these vacancies, bring in the type of business that we want, the type of development that we want and we will benefit from. Thank you, Bill. Jackie. Our biggest challenge right now is the pension and retirement liabilities that we have balanced against uh, what we're doing to be able to maintain an effective uh, workforce. Um, we have the challenge of city, long time, we're losing a lot of our institutional knowledge among city employees that are retiring um, at a rapid rate and not being able to recruit um, new employees to the city that can um, retain some of that knowledge and be trained and also competitively um, be competitive with the salaries that we're offering people. We've seen that in the police department where the police chief is having a hard time retaining officers um, from losing them to other cities. And so that is one of the things that I think believe we'll have to balance. Um, and in terms of the budget, Pasadena is a city of many priorities. And so we have to think about the budget and what we allocate funds to in terms of not just what our current situation is, but what our situation is going to be in the future. Thank you, Councilwoman. And um, you get to go first uh, on this next one. And the next one gets local, local for these folks, because uh, uh, I think it was Bill who brought up um, uh, vacancies. And um, this goes to South Lake Avenue, the, the primary you know, business district for the folks in these neighborhoods. There are significant Jason. vacancies. Larry, if, did you get Jason on that last question? Did yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. Just wanted to double check. I think he went first. <laughs> OK. No, he went, he, was, he went second. Okay. But I did get him. Uh, and he was very Thanks good. For looking out. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, OK, so this next one's going to go uh, lo local, local, as I said. The, the, the primary business area for this, these neighborhoods down here, South Lake Avenue, there's lots of vacancies, particularly in the larger spaces. Uh, most of the new businesses seem to be fast food. Uh, I have a wonderful quote here from somebody. There's more mattress stores per capita than anywhere else in Southern California, uh, in South Lake and Colorado Boulevard, too. Do you think there's a problem here? If so, is there a role for the city in creating a cohesive vision for the revitalization of this area? What would you do to bring that vision to fruition? Again, it's going to go uh, here. It's going to go uh, Jackie, Terry, Don. Jason, Bill, and uh, Alan. So Jackie first. 
there is a problem, but I don't believe that it's to blame on any one particular person or entity. Um, one of the issues is that we need a stronger consumer-friendly policies in the city because the reason that some businesses go out of business is because they don't have enough customer base. We discourage people and residents, frankly, from coming to certain areas of the city and parking and leaving their cars when we over-ticket, when we harass people, so to speak. Um, when they're out on the weekends and so we have to do a better job of encouraging our residents and visitors to come back to the business district so that they can patronize the businesses that are here. Secondly, for the um, businesses, um, I believe it's a function of the market as well. I think we need to do a better job at working with some of our building owners, which some of them are absentee, they don't live here, and um, they have somewhat of an um, out of range idea of what the current market is and so they can't get businesses that can afford the rates that uh, they're asking for. And so I believe that we have to do things both on the consumer side and the business side to stimulate our local economy so that the businesses can be um, successful. Thank you. Terry. Well, I, I think actually the nail salons outnumber the uh, mattress stores. <laughs> uh, but South Lake is making a transition from, um, from retail to personal service uh, and restaurant entertainment. Uh, we have, but we do, Jackie's right, we do have a landlord problem in some cases where we have absentee owners that have unrealistic expectations of what it takes to do business and attract new tenants. Uh, I meet on a monthly basis with the, uh, the PBID, the Business Improvement District, which is comprised of local businesses uh, working to improve South Lake, and we've had some success. I mean, there have been some new stores that, and restaurants that are being successful. But the, the region is over-retailed, um, and we've got a continuing challenge in terms of all of our business districts in South Lake and on Colorado Boulevard as well. Uh, but ultimately, I think South Lake will be successful because it's well-situated. Uh, it's surrounded by affluent residential and proximate to educational institutions. So I think the, the trend line will be positive on South Lake. Thank you. Don is next. I think part of the challenge for all of our businesses is that they feel as though they're functioning in a black box when dealing with our city. There's no transparency. There's very little clarity on um, what exactly the permitting and planning and fees are when dealing with the city. And so we see a lot of vulnerability uh, for those who are trying to start businesses. Uh, you know, with, with Lake in particular, you know, I would like to see us have some clear sense of what we're trying to be. You know, we used to have a lot of children's stores and there was some co con consistency or cohesion. Um, you know, I guess my question in all of this is I hear frequently that it's not the city and that it's not we're not anti-business or we're not, you know, we are business friendly. And my question is, if that's true, then why are so many businesses leaving? And I'm, I'm looking at a business owner who created an amazing restaurant on Lake in Neapolis that's now closing, uh, you know, who, who didn't have the luxury of waiting until some magic happens and we all start buying stuff. So we need to be more aggressive in the way we're addressing our planning in a place like South Lake as a city and incentivizing and bringing investment to make sure that we are uh, creating a strong commercial area. Thank you, Don. Jason. Well, I think one of the challenges that South Lake faces is lack of parking and its connectivity. I don't believe that they're connected to the traffic of, of Old Town and of the Playhouse District. I'm a big fan of Pasadena Passages, one of the initiatives uh, brought to my attention by the DPNA. And I believe that will kind of funnel more foot traffic and, and kind of broaden the, the, the density in the population and allowing more foot traffic to come to this area of Pasadena and actually share some of the, the profit and the potential in, in the, the growing population. Thank you, Jason. Bill. I think we have to figure out why do businesses leave. For example, Avery Dennison here, 30 plus years, suddenly it moves its headquarters to Glendale. Why? Um, I think we have to become a, a much more business friendly community. Uh, and I think we have to change the culture of people working at City Hall, plus, as I said a few minutes ago, put in place an economic retention team or a team that will work with businesses to entice them to stay here and or come here if that's it. We have vacancies on South Lake and, and uh, the whole type of uh, stores going there has changed dramatically uh, over the years. I don't, believe, I don't think we need to be a uh, restaurant uh, community. I think we need to figure out, sit down, make plans with the community. What is it we want to have, then go after it. Be proactive in terms of bringing business to us, not just sit back and except whatever happens to come along, or in the of South Lake, nothing. Absolutely. Um, 
Um, okay, uh, Alan is last on that one. Thank you. Well, I must say, as a 35-year business owner here on Lake in, in Cordova, I've seen three recessions. That's the first key. As mayor, I will implement my plan, which is to initiate an incentivized program to keep small businesses here and to work with large businesses just as the Grove, just as Americana, other places keep their businesses without a mayor having a vision uh, or experience of his community or knowing how to implement those things, it won't work. I've been sharing the same story for 35 years as a business consultant, real estate broker, uh, a JD in law school, knowing how to put the contracts together, knowing how to share with people, we must be proactive, we must be small business friendly, as well as knowing how to reach big companies, make sure they stay, embrace small companies, make sure they stay in our community so we don't have this cycle every time there's a recession and have blight in our area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's stick with this, uh, the economics kind of questions because um, I think that they're very interesting. Uh, I think that all of us here in Pasadena, we hate that Glendale thing. <laughs> where uh, the comparisons with Glendale, as Bill said, the very idea that Avery Dennison would, would want to move over there is, was, was galling. And uh, I don't want to go to the Americana, and I don't, but I, heard there's, I hear there's some good dim sum over there now. And, uh, so let's stick with a, with a, a jobs-related uh, uh, question. I'm going to combine two of the questions from the audience and from our uh, control group here into one. Um, and this one's going to go Don, Alan, Terry, Bill, Jackie, Jason. Uh, so the questions are about your plans for uh, creating and attracting more jobs into Pasadena. And I, and I also want you to answer at the end of it the minimum wage question, i.e., we've got Los Angeles pushing a, either a $13 or a $15 minimum wage. They're looking to Santa Monica and to Pasadena as the next cities in LA County that might go there. I know there's some business owners who are worried about it, but there's some uh, other arguments on the uh, on the supply side of that. So again, uh, your, your position on creating more jobs in Pasadena and whether you would be for uh, a new Pasadena-centric minimum wage. And uh, Don first. So we'll solve jobs and minimum wage in one minute. Well, yep. uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear the idea that we need a change in culture in City Hall, because I have to tell you, there are only three of us up here who are in a position to say we can do that, right? Um, you know, if we want to bring jobs to Pasadena, I've answered quickly how I think we need to support small businesses and being a little bit uh, more customer service oriented and helping them start up. But our big opportunity is around the innovation economy. We have Caltech and JPL and the Arts Center creating amazing products that want to go to market. We need to make it easier for them to create um, those businesses in our community, put the infrastructure in for high tech, um, for them to be able to start those businesses here and keep them here, which means we have to steward our relationships as a city with them and continue to support them, not just when they're renewing their lease, but throughout um, their entire time here so that we don't lose groups like Avery. Um, in, in terms of wages, any movement on wages has to be done in partnership with businesses uh, and to ensure that we are not driving uh, businesses out of our community. Uh, and so I think that I think it, we have to figure out a way to work in partnership uh, on that answer. What's that? It wasn't a yes or no question. Uh, he didn't even give a specific number. They yeah, I, I, I did give that, but you're right. And I'll give Don I'm, executive privilege a little more time to say you. yes or no. Thank you. I would not, as a city alone, without a regional or state movement, uh, pass a higher minimum wage. I think that we have to um, have a statewide act or a regional act so that businesses aren't leaving Pasadena and going somewhere else. Now, if they do um, pass those, then yes, I would support us going along with a higher wage and again, working with businesses to implement that over time, phased in, so that we're not driving our businesses out of Pasadena. Okay, thank you. Al. Thank you. Um, I would definitely um, vote for a higher minimum wage that ties into the program that I have a plan for as mayor. What that plan would be based on is a incentive for companies to come to Pasadena 
to leverage against growing employment here through Pasadena. And if they enroll in the program through Pasadena, Pasadena can get involved with giving them incentives, helping them with addressing payroll challenges, fees, and other things to give them incentives. This is exactly what Texas is doing to steal many of our corporations and businesses right from underneath our feet. We need to become more creative. In my 35 years of business and, and the experience I've had, it's about, it's about being innovative and knowing how to create retention. If we don't create retention, we'll fall into the same cycles over and over again. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Terry. We have a very uh, competitive environment. We, in fact, do have a business retention team. It had more successes than failures. Avery was a shrinking business in an antiquated building that basically got stolen by Glendale because the landlord there made a better offer than the Pasadena landlord was willing to do. The mayor was deeply involved on multiple occasions trying to retain that business. So the notion that somehow this is an anti-business town with not efforts being made to retain business couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, we do need to work hard at it. We have some successes. We have some failures. As I've said earlier, I think we need to play to our strengths, which at this point in time in the region uh, is hospitality, is innovation, education, and health care. Those are the places where we can develop new jobs. I support an increased minimum wage, um, but I would wait until Los Angeles took that action so we weren't out in front of that. Okay. Uh, Bill. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, as I said before, I think we have to put together a plan and actually go after the types of businesses that we want to have come here. Uh, you cannot sit back and, and say that's just going to happen. It doesn't work that way. So if we have an economic team at City Hall, it uh, I think needs a little bit of improvement and a little bit of direction as to how to bring business to our community. Um, the livable wage issue is very interesting because a few weeks ago on a Saturday, there was a, a packed crowd of Madison School uh, addressing this very issue. And as Peter Dreyer, who was one of the people forming that, uh, wrote thereafter, uh, city council members Jackie Robinson, Terry Tornick, as well as Don Morgan, Jason Hardnall running for mayor, the March election told a packed crowd that they not only embraced expanding the city's current uh, living wage law, which currently covers only employers' city contracts, to cover all public and private employers. Uh, so uh, that was their position then. I don't favor that, no. Restaurateurs are very concerned about that. They've come to me, and they are just paranoid over this happening. So I would not support that. I would work with people. That's the role of government, to work with people, reach agreement, reach agreement on how you do it, and then go and achieve that result. Thank you. Jackie. Um, so I'll start with the latter part of the question first. Uh, yes, I do support expanding the minimum wage in Pasadena. I think $15 uh, an hour is a good starting point for the discussion. It would have to include a very robust, robust community um, conversation about it, including with the business and especially the small business community. I think we have to remember that minimum wage employment in general was never intended to be permanent career-based jobs that people are um, um, caring for their families on, and unfortunately, in this day and time, it is. So I think it's something that we very much need in Pasadena and that we should begin to discuss. And Pasadena is, an, is, is a leader in our region, and we can continue to be, and we don't necessarily need to wait for the city of Los Angeles to do it. And I don't think it's going to be the end of the world. There are cities across this nation, like Seattle, where it's functioning very well. Um, in order to bring businesses and jobs to the city, we need to realign our planning department, increase the staffing there, because we did downgrade during the recession, but we see the local economy is coming back. And we need to make it more um, easier for small businesses to open in a, in a faster amount of time. Thank you. Uh, Jason. Well, answering the second question first, I do support a livable wage, and I do believe that we should expand our livable wage ordinance to all employees in Pasadena. I also feel that that will create challenges, but I don't believe those are challenges we can't overcome. Like I said before, we have a brand power. We have a, a powerful brand power in Pasadena, and we do have to be proactive as a city in teaching our businesses how to succeed. We do have a global market we can tap into that would be very lucrative for these businesses if we just taught them how. We have seven sister cities around the world with people interested in products and services that come from Pasadena. And I do think that if we kind of coach these businesses and just not leave them out there to just fend for themselves, but kind of teach them how to 
tap into our brand power because we should be the masters of tapping into our own brand power. The, gov uh, the local government should be experienced in that. So should we, we should pass that experience on to some of these businesses and teach them how to succeed globally. And that way we can overcome the challenges and be able to pay a livable wage. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going back to our first uh, uh, order, uh, Bill, Jackie, Jason, Terry, Don, and Alan. And we're going to a question about education. Here we are in one of the, well, the, one of the greatest private schools in the country, um, certainly in Southern California. Um, Pasadena has many excellent private schools, an extremely high rate of private school enrollment. Uh, vastly different from back when old folks like myself were in school here. Um, so how would you improve public schools so more families will want to enroll? And what is the mayor's role? Uh, is it just the bully pulpit? Uh, uh, or uh, can you use some of the charter elements of the city's involvement with uh, the PUSD to uh, improve public education here, Bill? I don't think it's a, a matter of using um, pressure or whatever else. I think the uh, PUSD, I mean, I'm president of the Board of Education, or of the uh, Past Educational Foundation Board. I work with the uh, PUSD consistently. Brian McDonald, the current superintendent, is very much open now. He's got five children in our schools here. So we need to make sure that all children get a great opportunity for a good education in the public schools, be able to read, write, add, and subtract when they get through. Right now, it's not the case, not only here, but across the country. We find a PCC, for example, roughly 65% of incoming students need help in the basic skills that we all learned years ago. So we're working very hard at PCC with PUF, or PEF, and with the school district to achieve that. But uh, it's not a simple question. The mayor has to lead on that, the same as the mayor has to lead everything else in the community. I've got the background education and the connections, and I can do exactly that as I am doing right now. Go, you mighty Mustang Jackie. <laughs> so as a PUSD grad, I am and I will continue to be the biggest advocate of our public schools. Um, I think that public schools should be a first choice, not the last choice for, for families. Um, I value our public schools and our teachers. And um, I'm glad that we have so many choices in Pasadena. I think there's space for our private schools and our public schools to work together in partnerships to, um, to bridge some of the gaps that exist in our public schools. I think the mayor has to be the voice for the council and be willing to write letters and speak on behalf of the council and for the council to take positions on state legislation that's going to help improve the public schools. We know that the city council is its own governing board separate from the PUSD school district, but we have to continue to work together and um, I have a record of being hands-on to help resol resolve some of the neighborhood issues that have emanated from the use of our schools amongst the residents, the parents, and the students. Thank you. Jason the Bulldog. Um, well, as Ms. Robinson said, it does come down to working together. Um, we do have to become more involved in our public schools for them to succeed. We do have to better educate the public on what's going on in our public schools and how valuable they are. Uh, last year, I was selected by the Pasadena Educational Foundation to be principal for a day, and it was a very enlightening experience. I got to see what really makes our public schools so great, and I think if more people got to see that, they would understand the value of the public schools, because public schools came about in our city overnight due to desegregation, and I do believe that we, if we educate the folks on why it's important to be uh, supportive of our public schools. That and, and why we should send our kids back to public schools and, and the reasons that the private schools are here aren't necessarily the same reasons why they were here before. So basically, we should actually become bigger fans of our public school system, because, uh, encourage parent part participation, and just educate the public on its value. So what school were you principal of? Excuse me? What school were you principal of? I was principal at uh, Learning Works Charter School. Learning Works Charter School, okay. Uh, Great school. Uh, Terry. Well, I'm, I'm more bullish about the public schools than many. Um, uh, I, I see the trend lines being very positive at the PUSD. Uh, I've got three grandchildren um, at the PUSD, and, and I think they're flourishing. Uh, beyond that, I think that uh, the city spends a great deal of money on children in our health department, in our 
Parks and Recreation Department and the, even the Police Department. And I think we have to find ways to support the children, make them ready for school. And, and we've got an initiative now called Collaborate uh, Pasadena, which I've been appointed to and I've been working on for the past six months. We met again this week to move that ahead. That will be one of my first uh, priorities uh, if I'm elected as mayor. Great, great. Uh, Don. So I think the first thing the mayor needs to do is continue to promote the amazing work that is being done in our public schools, you know, an 80% graduation rate, some really incredible things going on in our schools. Uh, but we know that they're uneven and that there's room to continue to strengthen our schools. As Brian McDonald says, make a good school district even greater. The opportunity for the mayor is to take and align the work of the 1,200 nonprofits we have in this community, many of whom actually work um, in education, and, 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 ensure, and ensure that they can provide things like arts education as the armory is for our public schools and uh, counseling and college guidance as college access plan is for our public schools and physical education as CATS is for our public schools. You know, make sure that we're bringing those organizations together to provide the things that we've cut away from public schools over the last 30 years through public budgeting cuts to better um, align their resources. And then as a fundraiser, I would say we need to bring funders to make sure that they are funding those most effective collaborations. That's what I've been doing for the last 20 years, uh, and I think that's an exciting opportunity for the mayor. Mustang Allen. Thank you. As a uh, PUSD graduate, I think it's imperative to get back to the basics. The basics for Pasadena to build is through partnerships here in Pasadena. As a realtor with the Pasadena Board of Realtors here, we try and reach out to PUSD to make sure we can be the voice in the community and work with them to make sure that they're elevating their performance in school and also that it's put out to the community in such a manner that we're starting to, to, to be recognized as a, as a high producing school district. Otherwise, it's gonna be the perception that Pasadena uh, Public School is still way below. The next thing I, I truly believe is that we have to focus in on uh, fifth through 12th graders. Uh, at that age, uh, Pasadena public schools really haven't focused in on it. As mayor, that would be the focus that my plan that I have within my initiatives to focus on them, to get them ready for transition into the, the workforce, vocational training, and other things that they would need for uh, transitioning to adulthood. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we haven't done a lot of fan introductions. Everybody's fancy in this room, but I do see, um, speaking of the subject we've been talking about one of our great superintendents, uh, Vera Vignes, in the room. And I just wanted to thank her for, uh, for uh, the work she did for the schools. Good to see you, Vera. Um, here's a, uh, a real nice uh, overall question. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's 2019. You finished your first term as mayor. What is uh, the single accomplishment you are most proud of? And what is the one single thing that differentiates you from the rest of the candidates here uh, uh, so that you can benefit Pasadena? And uh, let's see, we're on the second one. Bill started that one. Can you okay. say the second part again? Yeah, okay, was, sorry. Thank you. I, 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 I kind of mumbled my <laughs> way through that. What is the one single thing that differentiates you from the rest of the candidates? here that, that is going to get you to that goal, that single accomplishment you're most proud of in 2019 when you finished your, uh, your first term. And this is starting with uh, Terry. I think uh, the single greatest thing I could do would be to stabilize the city's budget and improve its financial condition. And I think because, I say that because I think everything flows from that. The various programs we've talked about, the things that we hope to achieve working with the PUSD and elsewhere, all rely on the city being in good financial shape. And I think what allows me to uh, differentiate myself there is that I have been uh, both on the public side as a department head, uh, as a commissioner, as a city councilman, but also I've had to meet a payroll and earn a living. Um, outside of government, and uh, and I recognize what the what the challenges are to operate a business, and and what it means to have to balance a budget. Great. Uh, and sorry, I didn't give the order after that, so it's going to go: Don, Alan, Bill, Jackie, Jason. Don. Well, knowing that the mayor's job is different than the city manager's job, I would hope that uh, four years from now, someone would look at me and say, as mayor. 
I was as a, a fraction, or I ran the city with a fraction of the grace that Bill Bogard ran our city because ultimately what we want of the mayor is someone who represents us as a community. Bless you. She coughs whenever I answer questions. Uh, we want the mayor to, um, to represent us in a way that makes us proud to be uh, Pasadena residents. And, and, and I think that that's an important thing to continue. And obviously, um, you know, I think that you can judge who, who is able to do that most effectively. I, I would hope that people would say that I represented all of Pasadena and I was able to bring my experiences working in vastly different communities to bring stakeholders together across the table who often disagree so that we could come up with collective answers to some of our toughest problems and were able to spread the more innovative solutions to our challenges across the entire region. Thank you, Don. Alan. Well, that's a, <clears throat> that's a difficult question for me. And the reason why it's difficult, because one, I've, I've developed a plan for Pasadena to get ready for the next chapter of Pasadena, which is about innovation, restoring small businesses, restoring the, the, the structure of PUSD in a partnership with our community to make sure we are in joint forces to bring forth what could be shown as a viable sound public education. More importantly, what distinguished me from the rest of the candidates or rest of uh, the individuals here is that I'm a product of Pasadena that's been in all the different communities growing up. Currently as a commissioner up in Northwest, I work very closely with grassroots programs to make sure I understand how to be a problem solver. With PCC, I'm the vice chair of the oversight committee to make sure the numbers are reconciled so that there's no problems with accounting. As a business owner, I've struggled through the economic challenges that make our community strong. Thank you. Bill. I would hope that uh, people would conclude that I have been um, a sound, effective leader for the entire community. It's uh, easy to say, well, I will work with people. Uh, I've actually done that and I've accomplished uh, things. And I would hope that people would look back and say, your four years have been very good. Uh, I've served before with Bill Bogard when he was mayor the first time around. Uh, I was on the council with him at that time. I would hope that people would say, I have the style and the temperament uh, that Bill does, and I'm able to get things accomplished. Uh, I would want to be able to focus on education, as I've said before, uh, with my background from PCC, from uh, Pasadena Educational Foundation, et cetera, to make sure every child has an opportunity for a great education in this community and work to bring jobs here so we have people who can be qualified to get a job and hold on to that job and the job opportunity is for them to do exactly that. So that's why we hope people would look back and say, you've done this. Thank you, Bill. Jackie. Um, in four years, I would hope that my single most uh, reference accomplishment would have been that I was able to effectively bring all corners of Pasadena together in order to have their voice represented at City Hall. Um, being the mayor or being a council member for that matter is not easy. Not everyone agrees all the time. And I always like to say that as council members, we don't necessarily get our own individual opinion. We have to gather the opinions of everyone and make the best decision that we deem possible um, from a combination of those. And so I think the thing that differentiates me from the other candidates is not just that I'm the only female running, um, but, um, <laughs> but that um, I have the necessary experience on the city council, the necessary real world experience from um, my outside employment on city council in education and in um, government and community relations, as well as uh, the necessary temperament to be able to collaborate with all of the council members and with the community. Thank you, Jackie. Jason. Well, in 2019, I want to be remembered as the mayor that eliminated the tale of two cities concept. I want to unify Pasadena. I want to uplift those that need uplifting who live in the poorest conditions. And I think what separates me from the other candidates is that I'm from those poorest conditions. I'm from the bottom rung of Pasadena. And to have made it from that to be a business owner, um, a dedicated community volunteer, and just an all around involved person, I think that that is what I can bring to those in Pasadena who need to be uplifted. I can show them that 
we can bridge these gaps, these social gaps, these cultural gaps, and we can do it together. And if we can do that, we can be a stronger city that can get a lot more done and create a lot more opportunities for its citizens. Thank you, Jason. Um, I think that the time has come for, well, there are some more questions, but boy, we've covered a lot of ground here. And so the time has come for this one minute uh, finalized, your last statement. Uh, one minute, we're going to go down this way. Jason, we're putting you on the spot again, and we're going down the table this way for the, for the one minute closing statements. Uh, so uh, Jason, come back at it. Well, um, I want to be mayor because I want to bring hope to the city. I've said that. I do believe that I represent all the diversity, challenges, and resilience that we face as an entire city. I do think that if given the chance, I can be inspirational to the folks that really need to be inspired and be better people in our city. I want to bridge those gaps. I want to uplift everyone. I do want to help our economy. I do want to help the folks who need it the most. I do believe that the Northwest is the most underrepresented area in Pasadena because we have so many issues that just go unattended because we are not uh, the Rose Bowl and because we are not Old Town. So I do kind of want to bring our community together by bridging those gaps because crime comes from extreme diversity and extreme differences in, in, in economic class. And I kind of want to bridge that gap to address those issues and kind of solve our city's problems. Thank you. Jackie. Thank you for this opportunity to present my case to you this evening for why I should be the next mayor of the city of Pasadena. As mayor, I want to Pasadena to be the most progressive and the most innovative and creative city. And in order to do that, you need a mayor that has demonstrated um, an ability to work across all stakeholders in the city of Pasadena, a mayor that's compassionate and a mayor that's willing to um, represent all of Pasadena. I prided myself as a city council member on listening to not just the voices that are in front of us at the council level or the biggest, loudest voices in the room, but also the voices that are not in the room. Um, I'm proud to be represented uh, and endorsed by a diverse coalition of individuals and organizations across the city, including the Democratic Party, teachers, women, and others. And I invite you to join me. I am respectfully asking for your vote. And I invite all of you to learn more about my campaign at Jackie Robinson, the number four mayor .com. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Bill. As I, as I said before, I'm the only person here who has actually served as the mayor of Pasadena. Uh, it's a unique position, believe me. It's not like something, anything else. It's, uh, you're not a figurehead. You've got to be the leader of the entire community. It's easy to say that you will do that, but believe me, when you get into that position, it's something entirely different. As mayor before and council member before, I accomplished a lot of things. The uh, old Pasadena, we built the parking structures there with taxpayer money. That wasn't a popular decision, but we did it because without that, no one would have a place to park. They wouldn't go there to shop or eat or whatever else. Uh, I wasn't getting paid to do that. I was getting actually in the city council for it. The One Colorado Project, again, we had to work effectively with everybody to find a developer who would go in and do that. Today, we've got Il Fanio, J. Crew, Patagonia, et cetera. The Colorado Street Bridge, we got money for that. UCLA at the Rose Bowl, we have accomplished that. Uh, the Aquatic Center, again, finding money to build that was uh, private money that I was in very much involved in helping to accomplish. The Langham Hotel, or what is it today, as the Langham Hotel. Again, we worked with the people there to make sure that when the old building had no reinforcement in it and the Japanese company that owned it sold it, we were gonna put a hotel there because that's what the public wanted. So I've done it before, I can do it again. I can and will lead as I've done before. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Bill. Terry. Well, thank you again to all of you for being for showing up and uh, for being willing to listen to us. Um, your challenge isn't over, that you're going to be flooded with uh, information over the coming weeks. I hope that you'll maintain your level of interest in this and, and, can, and review the material that you get carefully. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you directly. Um, you can call me at 375-0075 and I'll take your call. I value your ideas. I'd like to hear your suggestions and your, and your questions. Um, I hope that at the end of the day you'll conclude that I'm the best qualified person for the job and you'll give me the opportunity to serve our city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. Don. 
I think with 140,000 residents in this community, we know that we're big enough to have real challenges and opportunities, but also small enough and manageable enough that we can do things here that no other community in the country can do. And, and part of that is really piloting really innovative public policy to ensure that other communities are looking at what we're doing, learning from our successes and our failures, and then figuring out how to how to apply those on their own. And, and that's the exciting opportunity for Pasadena. This, this race is about vision. It's about the tense that we're using. You know, we want to be talking about the future as a community. Uh, I appreciate all of the work that's been done in the past in this community, and I'm thrilled with the community it's created today, but I also think we have not reached the end zone. And so we need to work every day to continue to push forward as a community and ensure that we are improving it every single day for our businesses, for our schools, for our residents, um, so that collectively we know that we are creating uh, the greatest community in the country. And, and that's what I want to do as your mayor, and, and I will work with you to accomplish that. Thank you, Don. Alan. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone, because I know this has been a long, late evening now. And I would like to share with you the reason why I believe I will make the best mayor. The reason why I would make the best mayor, because I love this city. I am so passionate about it that this is what have made my life. Coming from Jackson, Mississippi in 63, here to Pasadena, this became the Emerald City. I committed myself to be the best citizen I can be for this city and to know this city. I've been here on Lake and Cordova for 35 years as a business owner, seeing the recessions, putting together the only business plan for the city when I get into office to implement a way for everybody, every community, to participate in the next chapter of Pasadena. That's why I love this opportunity, and I want all of us to share it and embrace it. It will, captivate, or it will capture all the areas that we need to address, from jobs to our education to our schools to, thank you. <laughs> Good finish there, Alan. All right. I want to thank uh, uh, John and his great school and the use of this great hall uh, to the Madison and Oak Knoll uh, Neighborhood Associations, uh, and most of all to the candidates because I think they've left us with they've left me with a dilemma uh, as a voter, uh, as an editorial writer. I don't have the foggiest among these excellent candidates who uh, to vote for uh, or endorse because they were all eloquent and impassioned tonight. And I thank you all for that. <laughs>